Hi everyone, good morning. So let's get started. Um, first thing, thank you all for joining our tutorial today. Uh, my name is Li Cheng, and uh, me and uh, Yu Zhe uh, is here. So we are presenting our TAPA framework today. Uh, so, so as an overview, TAPA is just a data flow HLS framework. The input is a data flow program in C++, and the output so far is uh, an optimized RTO corresponding to the C++ and some Rivado configurations that can help the RTO be placed and routed in a good way. So basically, uh, in a data flow program, user have to define two things. Users first need to define some parallel tasks and define streams, which are essentially FIFOs that help the tasks communicate through each other. So Tapa will take this program and compile it into RTOs. And those RTOs will be sent to Whitey's or Vivado to be turned into the final B stream that can be executed on the actual IPJ. So we already have many HS tools and why do we need yet another HS tool and how is Taba different from uh, other tools? So uh, compared to existing commercial HS tools, the most uh, difference, different features that Taba has is that we explicitly decouple communication and computation. So, uh, what we do is that uh, uh, given a program, we will pass each task, each parallel uh, executing units to white is uh, for execution. So these tasks can be arbitrarily complex and we rely on a robust commercial tools to, uh, to handle them, them. And then uh, what's fancy is that uh, we will handle the communication logic generation by ourselves is that we, which means that we get the results from YTCHS and we determine how to compose them. Because communication is not that difficult to implement by ourselves, but it is very flexible. And to, to a much extent, the communication logic directly determines the final performance and, uh, or what we can do. So by generating all the communication logic ourselves, we have control over how the overall program behavior behaves and we can do a lot of interesting optimization to extend what an existing HS tool can do. So it's like we are standing on the shoulder of a commercial HS tool and we add more, we extend it to achieve more and go higher. Uh, yeah, so it is that it is the fact that we generate the communication logic by ourselves that we are able to bypass a lot of the limitations that uh, the commercial tools may have. Because you know, for the commercial tools, they have a lot of concerns. They want to be robust. They want to uh, appeal to most of their customers. But uh, since we do the communication by ourselves, we can do a lot of, do just whatever we want to customize the tool. So with this communication computation decoupling, we are able to achieve three major advantages. The first advantage is frequency. So with TAPA, we integrate a flow planning process into the high-level synthesis compilation process. So usually flow planning is a very low level uh, step. After the RTO is generated, it's synthesized, flow planning is done in a, in a conventional way. But what we do is that we move this step earlier. We combine flow planning with high-level synthesis. And uh, this helps us add pipelining to exactly where we need it. So that can uh, significantly help us improve the final frequency. So this part is published, was published in IPJ 2021. And uh, uh, at that time, we tested on some 40-ish designs, large-scale designs. And on average, we get a two-time frequency improvement compared to Vanilla Vivado. And this part wins the best, work, uh, best paper award at the PGA 2021. So this is the first advantage that we get from this uh, communication communication decoupling. 
The second is that uh, we have uh, richer expressiveness. It's because we generate RTO by ourselves for communication logic. As a result, we can define more APIs. We can define our own APIs. We extend the syntax of YTCHS. And for those extension part, we handled our two generation ourselves. And so what we need, we define API and we implement and code generation. So that can uh, help us achieve uh, rich expressiveness. And finally, uh, with this decoupling, we actually get faster. So because we compile each subset of the program separately, this, this, uh, this process can actually be done in parallel. In addition, we implement some lightweight simulation. So compared to a YT simulation, we use a much lightweight uh, light, uh, simulation model that runs faster than a uh, standard YT uh, step. So in, in the tutorial today, I will go into uh, more depth for each of these features and demonstrate how Tapa works. So here is some quick history of Tapa. It is not one paper, one project. It is actually a collection of multiple years of efforts from our lab. Uh, some sometime like five years ago, uh, when we are using uh, Vivado HS at that time, we noticed that uh, this tool has a lot of limitations. So it is slow. Uh, it come when we generate a large data flow design, it is very slow to compile, sometimes even slower than placement routing. And uh, there's a lot of limitations of what you can express with the syntax. So at that time, many of us like Yuzu and uh, other colleagues at that time, they try to, they have those initial idea of uh, compile each subset separately and uh, customize the RTO to compose them. So uh, the very first paper to give an engineering implementation of this idea was published at, at System 18 called STXL. It's a great paper, uh, you can check it out. Also, uh, user used this idea internally in his uh, uh, stencil acceleration paper called SODA. It's a best paper candidate at ICAD 18. And after that, we gradually generate this idea and build some internal tools for, for our other FPGA accelerated projects. And in 2021, this paper, uh, this project was first published under the name uh, TAPA and the effort was led by user. After that, with this, uh, with this framework gradually becoming more mature, we are adding more features. So, uh, later, I added timing backend timing optimization into this framework, and uh, from from then, a lot of our internal projects are relying on this uh, framework to get the frequency that we want and get expressed uh, computation pattern that we want. And recently, a milestone is that we have our first accidental users. So it's from Professor Zhen Manfang's group at San uh, uh, Simon Fraser University. So we collaborate with them and help them uh, migrate from YTHS to our uh, APIs. And uh, we have some very successful results and the projects are in submission. So uh, going forward, we are at, there are, uh, currently there are three developers in the Tapa team and Jason Lau, he's not here, but he is extending Tapa for the virtual platform. So, you know, the Silinx next generation ACAP platforms. So we want to map this data flow program onto the virtual as well. And also as a next step, we are going, we're in collaboration with Silinx to parallelize the placement routing part. So our initial efforts was published in FJ 2022 Best Paper Award, but it's not in, uh, integrated into Taba yet and we are in progress to do that. And if that is doable, we can, basically uh, go from the Tabas C++ program all the way to Bitstream within like one to two hours. So, but that's a future work. So here are a list of all Tabas publications. Uh, here are some 
uh, original publications that directly contribute to TAPA, and uh, here are some selected successful applications. Uh, so before I go into more depth for each part, I want to quickly demonstrate a hardware example to make things more concrete. So here is a uh, very simple type of program. It's a vector app. Basically, what we do is that uh, we want to reading one vector from or reading two vectors from external memory. We add them up and write the result back. So this is a classic IPJ Hello World example. Uh, so it's uh, just a few lines, uh, tens of lines of code, and I will introduce each part of them. So first, we define three tasks. Uh, here we have a function called add. So what add does is that it takes in like four arguments. A, B, C are both streams, and N is the number, is the length of the vector. And uh, we have a loop, it is pipeline. And each time we read an item from A, read an item from B, we add them up and we write back to C. So this is an overloading uh, for the write functionality. And this function called memory map to stream. So MMAP stands for memory map. In top of words, it's, uh, it means external memory. So basically what this function does is that it reads from external memory for N item and write items into a FIFO that uh, pass the data out. Uh, likewise, we have stream to memory map. Basically, this function does exactly the uh, the reverse of what memory map to stream does. It reads from a ex external stream, so someone else is passing the is passing the data in, and uh, we write those data to the external memory. So these are the three tasks that we define. So any questions so far about this this code? Okay, so next we define how the tasks are composed. So, so this is the top function of our vector add example. Uh, you can see that in the top function, we have, four, we have three uh, memory map arguments. So each of them represents one external memory and we have a, a scalar argument N, which is the length of the uh, vector. And we define three streams here, A, B, C. And so the type I invoke basically means I want one instance of this task. So remember that memory map to stream is a is function, add is a function, stream to memory map is also an extension. So this here it means that I want two instances of this function. I want one instance of add, I want one instance of stream to memory map. So in, in total, there will be four parallel processes running, uh, uh, running together and they communicate through this uh, stream, which are FIFOs. So if we compile through Taba, Taba would automatically generate a graph like this. So this is, uh, I can show you later how to view this graph. So this graph shows the topology of the design and how the tasks interact with each other. So we have two instances of memory map to stream here. So they read from external memory and they pass the data to, to this task called add. So add takes in uh, two input streams and has a one output stream. And this task just write the data back to the external memory. So this is a very simple basic type of program. I hope that uh, it can make things more concrete and less abstract. So back to our concept of decoupled computation and communication. To compile this program, we'll actually pass the add function, the memory map to stream function, the stream to memory map function to Whitehaze. So Whitehaze will handle the RTO generation for three of them. But uh, our top function, the web add, the RTO for this one will completely be generated by Tapa. And this is where the magic happens. We, we determine how to compose those uh, subtasks together to achieve what we want. So this is a basic, basic uh, example. Any questions so far? Okay. Uh, so next, I want to quickly show you that how easy it is to install Taba and how easy it is to just compile this program and get it running. So, 
Uh, okay, let's. Uh, So this is the uh, GitHub page for Tapa. It is under the UCLA Watts Lab organization. Uh, by the way, if you are interested, please give us a star. This helps us, uh, you know, get more noticed by and help more people uh, uh, know our project. And we have a dedicated uh, document website, so you can click here and that will lead you to our documentation page. So here, if you check this install tapa, uh, there are two ways. Uh, option one is a one click install and you can also build from source. So right now, we sub if you are running Ubuntu 18 or Ubuntu 20, uh, we actually support one click installation. Uh, but if you are on other uh, OS, you can do this step-by-step, uh, -step, uh, follow this step-by-step -step instructions to build it on your OS. So right now I'll just demonstrate uh, how to install Tapa if you are on Ubuntu. So I just copy this line. Uh, patient. So it requires sudo uh, permission. That's it. We are we are good to go now. Uh, to test whether you have successfully installed Tapa, you can try let's see, dash H. So it brings out the, the help menu of all the options that uh, Tapa has. So Tapa C means Tapa compiler. So we have a C here. Uh, and it shows all the options that we have. That is, that is uh, our one click installation process. So next, let's head to our we add example. So this is the uh, example I just show you on the slides. It's exactly the same. So uh, let's first try just uh, do C simulation. It's like which means that we just compile this program as pure C++. So I have this script ready. It's just using G++ to compile it. We have to append uh, add some libraries. So this is our, so this step is uh, included in the getting started Hello World section. So if you click run software simulation, uh, you can find instructions here. So I just uh, so I'll use this one. Not here. I'll copy it. Okay, now it's finished. And we can. So if you just run the binary output from G++, uh, it, it would do in FPJ terms C simulation, but essentially it's just a C++ program. Uh, it's, uh, the, task, the tasks you define will, do, will be executed in parallel. So it is a parallel uh, software program. You can run like any other program. And next, let's try to uh, comp uh, do C synthesize to turn this uh, piece of code into RTO. So I have another script here. So basically, we 
invoke Papa-C, we provide a few options. So the first option means that where do I want the output to go? This option mean, uh, means which function is the top function. So this is the part number, which FPGA device you want to target and which clock period you want to target. Usually I just go with 300 megahertz and uh, And this uh, dash O means uh, the output. So by default, we will assume that the users will go through the whitest flow. So in that case, uh, the generated RTO will be packaged up into a uh, file with the suffix .xo. So this is a standard Xilinx uh, uh, object. So with so basically this is a archive of all the RTO in your design and some metadata of your kernel. You can pass it to the Whitest compiler and the Whitest compiler will take you from here, from there and generate the final piece string. So this is the uh, the file, the source code file. So let's try to run this script. Let's take a look at the logs. So at the beginning, we'll print out the current version of Taba and we are act actively developing it. So uh, it updates very frequently. And we suggest that you keep Taba updated. Actually to update Taba is quite easy. Just run that one click installation uh, command again and you are all good. So what it is doing now is that it is invoking uh, uh, multiple HS processes and they each HS process compiles one task. And this 56 is because we have 56 cores on this server. So by default, we will, uh, the HS compilation process is not that memory intensive. So by default, we will just uh, use uh, however, however many cores there are. So right now the RTO synthesis process has already finished. What it is doing is that it is invoking Vivado to package up the, the, the RTO into the, that, that XO file that I mentioned to you before. So uh, that's what needed by the Whitehead compiler. Okay. So we can take a look at the output. It's under the wrong directory. So under the HDL are all the RTO files that is being generated. Uh, so notably like this, this one. So this is the RTO for memory map to string. This one is compiled by YTSHS. So you can, see, if you have read the output of YTSHS before, you will immediately recognize that the, this is its style. However, this one, uh, this, so this is the top function of our, our vector add. And this file is completely generated by Tapa. And we just instantiate each task and we define, we have some uh, optimization built into how they are connected and how the signals are adequately pipelined to avoid. And we have uh, embedded debugging uh, messages something like that. So basically that's uh, corresponding to this one slide. Uh, that corresponds to this part. Uh -huh. A few questions. So I think earlier I thought you were, uh, the, the, the communication was being handled by, um, you know, TAPA, but the computation was being, you know, uh, RTL for the computation blocks was being generated by Vitis. Exactly. But now in the design that we just saw, uh -huh. the the memmap to stream was generated by Vitis. I thought a memmap to stream was like a communication primitive, and so that would have been generated by Tapa, isn't it? Uh, no. What I mean is that so this this uh, memory map to stream is basically it means I read from external memory and write in your screen. So we consider this as, this is part of the computation. So actually you can do a lot of things here. It's not just, uh, you can also do some processing of the input data and then write back to 
the stream. So by communication, what I mean is how those tasks are composed. Okay, so not the endpoints, but the middle communication between one task and the other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How they are composed, that is what we are we are handling. Okay. And another question in the code, um, the simulation, the C simulation that we did, mm -hmm. there were two files, like there was a host file and the other file. Can you please explain that a little bit? What was the Oh yeah, yeah. There's a there will be a host file. I didn't show that. Uh it's exactly the same as how you do simulation in in uh, YDSHS. Uh, so, so this is the kernel code. So this part will be turned into IPJ. This is the kernel code as I showed in the slides. This is the host code. So it's uh, uh, basically, basically it's a pure C++ code. We define uh, the vectors ABC, which will be passed as arguments to the to the kernel and we initialize the ABC vectors. And here we call tapa. So here but we call the kernel function and pass the arguments in and the, the runtime will be returned. So this is the host code. So is there an assumption that um, this code, like the, the, the FPGA has to be, um, you know, a, it has to have a PS and a PL and the host, basically, the ARM processor will run this host code. It will invoke the kernel on the PL, and that's how it will happen. Is that oh, sorry? What do you mean by PL? So I, I, PS and PL. I think what you mean is you, what you call the host. It is in in the auto HLS referred to as the test bench, right? Yeah. So so okay. So there are two things here. The execution, the default execution model is that we assume there will be a CPU. There will be an FPJ, and the default execution model is that the CPU will, uh, the CPU runs the host code, it generates the input data, it writes to the DRAM, and the FPJ reads from that DRAM and do the processing, write, write it back, and the CPU continues. So this is the default execution model, but you don't need to strictly follow that if you are if you just want to generate some RTO and uh, use it in your specific situation, you can take the RTO and uh, do whatever you want. But the default, the host here is that just by default, we assume there will be a CPU and an FPGA. And the host runs on CPU, the, the kernel runs on the FPGA, and they communicate through shared memory or streaming or whatever. Thank you. Yes. So with your, with your memory map, is that instantiating one of the the Vado Gmail instances. Yes, it's uh, interfacing with the XC memory map. Okay. Um, how do you handle bursting and can you support? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, can well, you well, back to back. We active? definitely can handle burst. Uh, we can. We'll uh, talk about that later. And so you also support Axie Lite interfaces for register control of the of the core. Uh, by default, we will gen we will use the the in the full Axie interface, but it's not difficult to do more customization to to generate the Axie Lite interface. We do have a control module for yeah uh, using the Axie Lite interface, but that's just for issuing the scalar inputs and also control the start and the stop of the actuator. Okay. Uh, yeah, the, the metadata, the, those are scalar arguments, they are passed into the actual line. Okay. Those are, those are the, the first data, the large chunks, they are passed through the, the full actual protocol. Okay. And sure. sorry, um, just uh, the, the interfaces with, I probably actually did not get this last part. Uh, so I'm just maybe clarifying the interfaces between the tasks. Are they AXI interfaces? Uh, between tasks are five interfaces. Just um, uh, bear the, the minimum handshake uh, interface. One signal going forward, one signal going back, and this is data. Okay. So between task and external memory is XE. Between task, between two tasks is just five. Just. Gotcha. Do you maintain the restriction that that is had until I think the most recent release where you cannot have bidirectional communication 
in the data flow tasks. So you can have bidirectional. You, you just, just define two ta two five volts, one yeah. going forward, okay. one going, cool. going back. Any other questions? You will have to express that explicitly, right? Like two 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 directions in these yeah, yeah, yeah. code that we write. So basically in this host code, if you want bidirectional, you just <coughs> instantiate another stream. Okay. You no. Know. Thank you. So however you want them being composed is it's doable. If it's not doable now, it can be doable in the future because we control our generation for this. And there's no fundamental challenge for what you just described, right? And that it actually is already supported. Just define two two five poles, one going forward, and one going back. The logistical question: Will we have access to these slides? Well, of course. Okay. I'll put that in either in the GitHub repo or in the in the uh, our website page. Okay. Thank you. And if you have further questions, just you can send us an email or open that give us issue anytime. We'll be more than happy to uh, answer them. Uh, so coming back, uh, what I just demonstrated is the how to compile, uh, how to synthesize the the uh, the Tapa program into RKO. Uh, so, Tapa has Tapa C has a lot of options, but uh, these are the core options, the most fundamental ones that uh, make it work. But uh, we do have a lot of other uh, more advanced options that uh, I can talk about later. But these are the minimum options we need to just compile the uh, host code, I mean kernel code, into from Spellsource to RTL. So, okay. so next I'll quickly show how to run uh, RTO simulation. Uh, tapas, so first this work, work as that .xo, it can be used to run simulation with the standard whitehead tool. Uh, if you have a whitehead host, you can use your host to uh, invoke uh, uh, this, uh, this .xo file to do the simulation. But now I'll demonstrate our own simulation method. So, so the command is uh, very basic. Uh, if you do not, so we use the same host code we just compiled. If you do not provide anything to the binary, to the host binary, it will run software simulation. If you add this dash dash b stream option and provide uh, uh, this dot xo archive that we just generated, it will switch to oh okay this is not good. Oh, sorry I forgot one option yeah okay. uh, so basically these uh, these arguments uh, means the length of the vector. By default, is, uh, it will run a very, very huge vector. And that's not good for RTO simulation. So we had a, we had a default size limit. And if you go, go, go above that size limit, it will issue an error. But you can override the option if you want, if you do want to write, run a very large simulation. So for now, I will run a small RTO simulation because RTO simulation is uh, not as fast as software simulation. So this 1000 means that the length of the vector is 1000. And uh, basically it generates a lightweight RTO simulation model. And uh, right now we are already switching to Vivado. So all the RTOs, all the test benches, they have been generated and Vivado is starting uh, its uh, simulation. And if you are for me, uh, so right now our clusters may have some issues. It has it is slow in loading Vivado, but in a normal case, Vivado will already have pumped out and start the, the simulation. So if you are familiar with Whitey's simulation, it actually takes a long time to uh, to to set up for the test bench, but we just set up, set up instantly. 
So right now it is not our problem. It's our Rivado is uh, get stuck. It's too big. Oh, okay, it's there. Rivado is now like eighty gigabytes, and uh, we are running on a sh on a distributed file system. So we need to pull Rivado from remote to local, and that takes some time. Uh, so what you are seeing now is just uh, Rivado log because all the test benches have been passed to Rivado and uh, now it is doing its internal thing, internal things to run the simulation. So I'm not sure if you have used what is uh, simulation before. So for this vector add application, just setting up the simulation, it may take like 15 minutes. So it's a pain to wait for that. But right now we all you know, this, we are start, already start running and exit we pass, we are already done. So there's uh, much, much, much faster than using YTS Ajax. And it's, uh, as I mentioned, if you do not provide anything at all, it's, some, it's software simulation. If you provide this .xo, it's a uh, RTO simulation. And later, if you provide the, the hardware bitstream, it will run. Uh, it will it will load the bitstream to RPG and the to the onboard execution. So all the all three functions are in the same host program. You just provide different inputs, and based on the input, you will select the uh, the method that you want to do the execution. So this is a quick demonstration, and uh, I'll switch to another server to demonstrate onboard execution as well. Uh, okay, so this is on another server uh, that has actually has an FPJ attached to it. So we're, I'm running another application with a previewed binary. So so this is the act. This dot XC or BIN, which means silent open C or binary. So this is a wrapper around the APJ B stream that is being used by Whitey's. When you do that, uh, you can see there the log is different. Uh, it says running onboard execution with silent open seal, and it found the platform silent. So this is uh, running on an HBM U280 XDMA. And basically, what is wrong? See, it does is read and write two gigabytes of data, and this is kernel time, which means that we are saturating that. Uh, we're using like something like three hundred ninety gigabytes of HDM bandwidth. So this is not the the, the perfect bandwidth, but it's uh, it's a small demonstration toy demonstration. So this is if you provide, as I mentioned, if you provide the the hardware stream to this option, you will run. Uh, the actual onboard execution. Okay, now uh, I hope that uh, the, the this demonstration give you a concrete sense of what Taba is, what the Taba program is like, how to install Taba, how to run CSIM, COSIM, or onboard execution. And next, I'll continue to uh, go into more depth on the theory part of why we can achieve the previously advantage, uh, advertised advantages. So I'll start with the frequency part. Uh, so you know that currently FPGAs are becoming much, much bigger and we are, set, we are suffering from the, the, the degrading frequency. So here we have an example. So we just use a systolic array. Systolic array is it's supposed to be FPGA friendly, right? It has a uh, click, I mean, uh, basic uh, spatial arrangement. So the, what, the, what this figure shows is that as we increase the size of this static array, we start from a 13 by two array and we increase the size of that array. Uh, we can see that uh, the frequency, the, the blue crossing, means uh, achieve frequency. They are just dropping. As we increase the size, this frequency is dropping. On the other side, the runtime, the placement routing time is getting higher and higher. So this is a problem. So why is that? There are two major problems, uh, major issues. The first is the abstraction gap uh, between HIS and uh, the backend. So uh, 
when you write a SQL, they just compiler is, uh, is there's no magic in here. It just compiler does not know the physical location of uh, those uh, logic. For example, here, let's consider that uh, in, your, in your SS code, you have a function foo. So foo generates some output, you want to pass the output to bar, to pass to another function. So it's a uh, very, very basic, where the most simplest case, you want to pass some data between two modules. So the RTO will be something like uh, uh, at the post edge o'clock, the output of foo will be writing your register, probably that register will be consumed by the bar. But uh, how many how many pipeline levels do you need here? You register once or twice or third, three times. There's no uh, knowledge uh, that edges has can to determine how many pipeline levels you need. So very common, maybe four and the bar are actually far apart. So one level of pipelining is not needed. So this is common. So this abstraction gap between the high level C++ and the low level layout is one important reason why uh, we don't have the, the frequency we want. And this problem will be aggregated as we scale up the, the design. So for small design, probably is fine. But for large design, this problem is severe. <coughs> Another important reason is that you know the devices are getting complicated today. We all know that uh, the the latest devices have multiple dyes composed together, and it's a pain to cross the dyes. So we'll have additional signal delay to cross these uh, dye boundaries, uh, and the the capacity for dye dye crossing is very limited, and. Those IPs, they are huge. They take a lot of area. And they also form kind of physical barrier. And all these physical uh, barriers, they are not considered and they cannot be considered by, by the by pure C to RTO comp uh, compilation. So what we propose uh, in your last year in episode 2021 is that uh, uh, the traditional way is that we first run it as the RTO, after the RTO is generated, we pass it to back end. So in the traditional way, the just part and the back end part, they are completely decoupled from each other. But we think that this is not the right way to go. So we move the full planning part forward. So we combine each other the full planning. So back to our, uh, back to our full and bar example. If we know that, okay, who is here and bar is here, we know that there are parts in one level of planning is not needed because they are multiple level uh, for planning. And uh, that's exactly what we did. So we just kind of reorganize how things are done. We merge, uh, combine HS full planning with HS pipelining to uh, kind of reorganize how this stack is, uh, is, is performed. So a lot of the, uh, so back to how that's related to Tapa. Again, since we do this decoupled computation and communication, uh, we first, you know, we first compile each task separately through YTCHS. After that, we have an area estimation of, uh, of each task. So we just do this for planning. So in this example, uh, this is the pure data flow graph and uh, we can do some, Basic flow planning using some uh, simple algorithms. And if we know that, okay, two is here, seven is here, two and seven are far away apart. Okay, when we generate the communication logic, when Tapa generates the communication logic, Tapa know Tapa does this extra pipelining uh, to make sure that the data link between two and seven will not become the critical path. So that's how things work. This full planning has two level of uh, implications. So first, uh, we will ensure that the logic is properly spread across the whole device so that we remove local congestion. In the meanwhile, for these global connections, we adequately piped on them. So they be, we know that they will not become the critical uh, global critical path. So these two factors combined together, they can get us huge performance in uh, frequency improvement. So I'll show two case studies. Uh, 
So this is for a, a triangular systolic array. Uh, as we scale up the sizes of the array, we we show the comparison of with and without uh, our flow plan and, and pipelining. And this is on the U250, and this is on the HP and U280. So on this figure, on, uh, on the left, you can see that by default, uh, the placer will try to pack things together because it knows that die crossing is bad. I don't want die crossing. So it will try to squeeze things together, pack it densely. But what we do is that we evenly spread out, we utilize, we make good utilization of the bank space and we spread the entire, uh, spread the logic to the entire device. And meanwhile, while we will adequately pipeline the long data lanes to make sure that they don't become a problem. This is another example. So it's it's very, very simple. It's just four kernels, four big kernels. They're in a chain shape, one, two, three, four. So by default, uh, what is this just, uh, no, I mean, the, 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 the placer, they don't have this high level knowledge of how this design is composed of the topology of the design. So it actually make a, a poor choice of placement. But uh, what we can do is that we have a nice need just one kernel, one slot. So, and all the uh, between kernel data links are properly pipeline. Uh, so next I'll demonstrate, make a, a simple demonstration how to enable this pipelining to the uh, to the Tapa C, to the Tapa framework. Uh, so compared to uh, our previous uh, example, we just add two more arguments here. So uh, this argument basically it's uh, it means with the name of, so uh, if, if you enable full planning, there will be additional file generated, which is a TICO file. This TICO file uh, con contains all the Vivado configurations that we need. So this will be passed along with um, uh, the RTO. So if you provide this option, uh, full planning will be enabled. Meanwhile, we need this connectivity file. So what it, what it does is that uh, it specifies uh, the, the binding between your virtual buffers and the physical uh, ports. So this, so this is a standard Xilinx file file format. It basically means I want to bind variable A to DDR0. I want to bind variable B to DDR1 and C to DDR2. So you need just two more arguments to enable flow planning in its most basic uh, usage. So. Let's try it. The logo shows that the full plan is enabled because I, you you provide that option. Again, we have we first uh, run. Uh, around high level synthesis to compile each task. Okay, so this is more design. So full plan is already done. Let's go through the log. So the name is Auto Bridge. It's the IPG twenty one name. So it's Auto bridge is now a plugin of Tapa, so it has been integrated and it brings out the version. And so here we just show some basic, the, the basic log and the detail log will be recorded in the file here. So by default, we want, we hope, uh, if you want to run auto bridge on some, on some large designs, we highly recommend that you install this Groby solver. It's a commercial server, but it's fully free for academia. Uh, you, if you apply for a license and install it, it takes you like 
three minutes, but it cannot be automated. You have to do it manually, uh, but it only takes you three minutes. We have instructions on our document on how to install this. So uh, there are some only, uh, default parameters set for you. If you want to know the meaning of each of them, we have documented it in our website. So we'll first print out the size of your design. Uh, so this is a very small design. So the, you can see it's just 1%, less than 1% usage. Uh, and you will print out how many SR crossings that you, uh, you will need to use after, the, uh, so in the final, after the full planning finishes, it will print out the uh, SR crossing usage and it will print out the slot, I mean, uh, the area usage, the, the resource usage of each area of the design of the device. So, and to now it finished uh, correctly. So it would generate, uh, it would generate automatically generate some scripts for you that you can use to run to invoke white uh, white HS. So we will generate a. So this is an auto generated. Uh, script that will invoke the V++ compiler. So this is the Vitis compiler that will uh, take the XO uh, object and it will also uh, so it will also take in these constraints that encoded all the our full planning results and pass it to Rivada as well. So if you look at the Tico uh, it is uh, basically, so here we are defining some uh, floor planning p-blocks if you are familiar with, with all, the, with all the things and it will add, assign each of the tasks to one of the p-blocks. Uh, yeah, so it's like this. And the pipelining will be automatically done and it's inside your RTO. So if you look at your RTO, you can see, yeah. You know, this kind of, these are all pipeline generated to uh, to cross those uh, SORs and to make sure that uh, things are, look good. And it will be adjusted accordingly uh, based on your device and uh, the location of them. And another interesting thing is that uh, we will automatically generate a photograph. So you can, use this to visualize your design. So if you copy this, and if you go to some, for example, there are many online. Uh, this one. If you paste it here, it can give you a visualization of what your design is like. So it can be quite handy to, to, to understand, to have a, have a feel of what you are writing. So this is all generated automatically and you can try that. And we, we have some, uh, so so this is uh, another design we previously done. It's a very complicated one. So, yeah. uh, let me show you a complicated one. Yeah, so this is our FJ 2022 paper for uh, sparse matrix. Uh, vector multiplication. So, you know, in this kind of level of complexity, it's very important to have some visualization. And by the way, I, we actually support a hierarchical uh, task define. So you don't need to define everything in the same level. You can define it hierarchically. So that can make your sure life much easier. Have you tried uh, this on any of the more complex DSP routines in the Vitus libraries? 
Oh, sorry. Have you have you tried running Tapa on any of the more complex cores that the bottom provides in the or Silent provides in the Vitus DSP library? To, to kind of gauge, you know, the, the impact on real world. Really yeah, 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 definitely. We have some very large designs, like use 80% of DSP on the, on the device. We have a lot of them. So that's, that's the, why Tapa is designed. It is designed to handle super large design, designs. 80% DSP usage, 80% VRAM usage. We can do that. Is, is, do I answer your question? Uh, well, not not really. I, so, so the, uh, Xilinx has released the the Vitus DSP library, which is uh, on GitHub, and it's, it consists of a number of fairly large. For instance, they have a, a super sample rate FFT that can go to you know several thousand uh, points. Uh, no, those are manually optimized. Right, they're manually optimized, but they're still too slow for my purposes, for instance. And so I'd be curious if you guys have tried applying this library to these more complex codes that have already been uh, We don't have that for now, but we can definitely be looking into that. And um, we can, I think we can take that offline and- uh, Okay, sure. And uh, uh, I need to know more about your situation. Sure. But for now, we, we don't have those kind, we don't use those kind of libraries. Okay. Yeah. Sure. How, is, how is Groovy server used for uh, for planning in this case? So basically, it's a server. It's a commercial server for individual linear programming. We have so Tapa uses uh, by default it uses an uh, open source version, open source server, but that's much slower. If we'll check if Groovy is installed. If it is, we will switch to Groovy because it runs fast, much faster. Okay, oh, sorry. I mean, uh, do we use integer linear programming to partition the design or do we do any other? Just done automatically and it's transparent to the user. Between the problem and trying to minimize the local usage of the core heights so that the user can consider the area of each model so that logic can spread roughly evenly among different blocks. So that's why we use a linear programming uh, model to solve the problem. Questions: How does uh, how does that uh, um, affect the uh, compiling or maybe synthesize time? Like, uh, does it uh, increase it compared with uh, the top? So for HSC, uh, uh, so the question is how does Tabla affect uh, the runtime or the compile time? So for high synthesis, it's much it's much faster. For the CTU RTL compilation, it's much faster. For the RTL simulation, it's much faster. For the RTL to be stream, is the same time, the exact same time as uh, Vivado. Okay. But in the future, we'll make that shorter as well. Thank you. Uh, so the question is whether the Tapa works on you know small IPJs, right? Well. Uh, is that what you mean? Yeah, uh, with one logical region. Uh, we have not tested on that yet. Uh, but if you have a need, we can just try definitely try it out. So internally, most of our designs are those super large designs. Yeah. So we we currently we only tested on those three dice, four dice, uh, those kind of larger PJs. But we can definitely try on it if it can be improved on. It can give an improvement on small devices. I assume that there may be an improvement on frequency for small, like zinc devices, but not as obvious as those large scale designs. But still, with Taba, you can you know compile faster and write more complex, uh, flexible code. So, uh, yeah. yeah. So can can we? Well, can we say this is not aiming for like a, a embedded system. This is pretty much more for cloud applications. Yeah, so uh, we we don't know uh, for now how it will behave on small devices. At least when, uh, I'm sure that it will not get worse uh, because the how, as you see in the history, we developed this tool because our need to implement large generators. That's how Tapa is, is born. So, but if you have a need, we can definitely try it out. And, uh, just send us an email of your need and so we can 
chat offline. Uh, any other questions? Okay, so I'll continue the presentation. And for the uh, frequency part, we have some dedicated optimization specifically for HPM boards. So everybody knows that the HPM has a high bandwidth, but it's very hard, very, very hard to actually make good utilization of this board. So actually there are quite some physical challenges uh, of how to use HPM boards. So first, we all know that all the 32 channels, they are clustered together at the bottom at one side of the device. So these 32 ports, that means, and each is uh, 512B wide, that sums up to uh, 16,000 bits of interface. So there are 16,000 bits of input. But if you cal calculate how much wire can travel from SR0 to SR1, this is only about 20,000. So there's not much that you can do in the, in, in the, in the SR0. And, uh, and additionally, each, uh, we need an IO module to handle the XC transactions for each uh, HPM channel. And those modules have an area overhead. It's, it is okay to have one module, have two modules, but when you have 32, you, when you multiply the area overhead by 32, that's quite some error. That's quite a, quite a big amount. <clears throat> so uh, we have done some optimization specifically for to handle this situation. Uh, so the first is that uh, we uh, included the HPM binding process into the flow planning process. So usually if you go with YTSHS, you have to manually specify which HPM channel you want to use for which uh, virtual buffer. So you need, to you need to manually define the, the binding from your virtual buffers to the physical channels. And uh, that may be fine for like a DRAM based DRAM devices because you only have like four or three DDRs. But now you have 32 channels, so you need to manually determine the mapping of 32 HPM channels. And if you just write it randomly, most, most likely your uh, binding can be a problem itself. So to improve this problem, we incorporate this step, these binding decisions into our full planning uh, process. So when we do the full planning, we'll consider this binding as well and to ensure that uh, the resources are balanced and there's no local congestion. So this is the first optimization. And the second optimization is that, as I mentioned, the HBM IO modules, they have error overhead. If you look, use YSHS by default, uh, each IO module will cost you 15 BRAM 36K. And if you use all 32 channels of HBM, these our modules, they alone will cost more than 70% of all BRAM seen in the first, uh, you know, in the, in the bottom die. And those our modules alone can most likely make, give you a routing failure. And we have uh, done quite some optimization to improve this part. And if you use our, use, use our API and we can generate a much uh, use a much smaller IO module that do not use VRAM at all, use much smaller uh, flip-flop, and we have slightly higher lot usage, but uh, I think it's a huge gain compared to this uh, uh, VRAM reduction. So this is the second optimization that we've done for HPM. And finally, uh, as I mentioned, the in, in the case of HBM, there's a severe wire pressure as long as the uh, as well as the resource pressure. We have sixteen thousands of bits connected to external world, but each SR boundary only have two thousand uh, twenty thousand uh, bits. So this is a problem as well. So in this case, uh, 
what, what we observe is that if you just uh, run one pass of floor planning, it's not enough. So what we do is we generate multiple floor planning configurations, then we run back and add in parallel and see which one gets better. So some, some floor planning results may, you know, uh, have higher local air usage, but the lower uh, die crossing wire usage. And some other floor planning may, you know, use more SR crossing wires, but have uh, smaller local area congestion. So this is a trade-off and we generate all data points, all points on this Pareto optimum curve and we run backhand together and just, just test it out which one works the best. So this is the third HPM optimization that we have. So with that, uh, con we conclude uh, our first advantage, the frequency, uh, frequency advantage. Basically in summary, we add the full planning process into the Hello synthesis step, and since we since Tapa has this decoupled communication communication, we hand Tapa handles the communication itself, and it can does this uh, fancy pipeline to improve the frequency. And next, user will present the second and third feature of our framework. And uh, uh, let's welcome Isa. Thank you, Lishan, for the great. Uh... Thanks to Lishan for the great presentation and the demo. Those uh, quality of a result improvement brought by Tafa is really exciting, right? Are you ready to get started with Tafa? If not, I will give you more reasons to try to use Tafa. Tafa not only gives you um, frequency improvement as an improvement for the quality result, it also speeds things up when you are developing applications. Say that you are a decent application developer and you are just getting started to design your world's fastest and most energy efficient accelerator for your application. You would start doing that by writing C++ code, right? Because you are trying to use HLS. And once you have a draft, you would want to try to run software simulation, which Li Zheng has already demonstrated. That process actually can be accelerated by Tapa with its optimized protein based uh, software simulation library. It is faster because it not only launches multiple parallel threads, it also co cooperatively schedules those each of the task instances so that they never preempt with against each other. Whereas if you use YTSHLs natively, uh, you will find out it does not support the uh, feedback or loop communication just because it's running sequentially. If you try to do manually um, thread-based parallelization, you will find that if you have more than 100 tasks, it just uh, will take like 10x time compared with the sequential execution. So that's the first thing that Tafa can help you speed up with. Once you have uh, finished uh, your software simulation and your functionality looks good, you will start to try to run high-level synthesis to generate RTL, right? And that's the second part that Tava can accelerate. This is accelerated by invoking Vitis HLs for each computation task separately and in parallel. Tava also identifies the uh, unique tasks from all the task in definitions so that it does not repeatedly synthesize different instances of the same task many times. This is different from Vitis HLs, whereas uh, in what is HRS? Data flow designs are always sequentially synthesized and the different instances are being synthesized many times. Once RTL code is generated and you have inspected the RTL report, you would want to verify that uh, your RTL code actually behaves the same as your HLS input, right? Because, uh, sometimes HLS compilers can make mistakes. This is another thing that Tapa can speed up while you are developing the, uh, your accelerator. Nichon has already demonstrated that uh, Tapa provides a lightweight simulation module that can help you set up your RTL simulation almost instantaneously. Whereas if you are using widest simulation, you have to wait for 10 minutes. And the benefits you got is that widest simulation has bench models the not only the X interfaces, but also the DDR model, the HBM model, and the PCIe 
um, directly memory access models. However, the memory model is still, it's more accurate than what Tapa does, but it's still not psycho accurate. You still cannot, uh, you are still not confident that whatever you are seeing from the whitest simulation matches 100% with your onboard execution. So we think this Tapa fast RTL simulation can give you a lot of gain with a almost negligible overhead. Okay. So what's your design passes? Uh, uh -huh. okay. uh, I have a question about how Tapa reduces the time overhead to set up the simulation. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, uh, how does Tapa do that? Like, what's the magic? Uh, we just use a very lightweight simulation model. We do have those complex uh, data RPs. Because uh, we think that when you're doing simulation, you just make sure, want to make sure that okay, it's actually Portable and it's fine. We don't want uh, a complicated, complicated DDR IDs there. We don't want a complicated HPM IDs there. They're not necessary for simulation, right? For simulation, you want to catch for some uh, uh, syntax errors. You want to catch some behavior level errors. You want to know whether you want it that's in protocol, this kind of errors. But if you really want to see the performance, you need to run on board. That's our uh, what we think. At least in most cases, we're dealing with, you know, those um, uh, syntax errors or specific type of um, probably violation of vaccine protocols. Those are the majority of the bugs. And we should use a lightweight model to, simulation model to help you catch those kind of bugs. But anyway, you can uh, still run the complicated and sophisticated uh, body simulation at the end just for one pass. And or we never use it, we just go through this stream. And just in case you, uh, you are curious why you set up time is taking so long, but then it's mainly because each of these models cannot be pre synthesized or pre compiled because it's determined by how you use it. And uh, based on that, the uh, by the simulation platform, we have to customize each part, and that requires reading and writing a lot of files and combining a lot of resources. Any other questions? Okay, cool. So yeah, so now that you already have your RTL code ready and it passes software a uh, code simulation, the next step would be to generate bitstream, right? As Lisha mentioned, we try to accelerate that part as well, but it's still work in progress. So I will leave uh, that part to Lisha when he talks about the future steps. For now, let's uh, look at the last but not least uh, improvement brought by Tapa, which is richer expressiveness. As you probably realized, there are many pinpoints when you use Whitehead's HIs, and uh, one, a very common one is accesses to the external memory. If you just uh, use the regular YTS HS external memory interfaces or use the TAPA MF interface, you will find that writing accesses to the external memory is very simple. You just uh, access whatever you need as an array, but that also limits the things you can express. And oftentimes, you just have to guess what the HS compiler is doing for you. To solve that problem, Tapa provides an alternative memory interface called asynchronous memory interfaces. It decomposes the request from the response. It exposes the five XC memory channels to the user directly. If you are familiar with the XC protocol, the five channels are, uh, are two, read interfaces and the three write interfaces. And um, as you know, HRS heavily relies on memory bursts to fully utilize the FPG memory bandwidth, right? But if the users were to manually schedule the memory interfaces with bursts at requests, it can be much more painful than just uh, using the regular interfaces. That's why we decided to add a runtime burst detection module to extract the sequential individual accesses 
into burst access so that users only need to worry about the request address and the re response data. Let's take a look into an example. So this is an example where we are trying to issue memory reads with a sequence of uh, randomly generated addresses, which are generated here using this function. And it is achieved using two different computation tasks. The first one is called issue read address. What it is doing is that it tries to write n addresses to the memory channel called the read address. When, as long as it's not full, it will write one address to that channel. And once it is written to the read address channel, some cycles later, usually if you are using DRAM, that's uh, tens of cycles later, you will be able to read the corresponding data out of the memory channel called the uh, read data. So that is what is being done using this receive read response task. And the memory interface is similar, but it's uh, slightly different from the regular TAPA mem memory math interface. It's called ASIC MM. And notice that you have to put a um, reference sign here. This is uh, required as of now. And when you are instantiating the tasks, you just uh, need to instantiate your two tasks as uh, you would do for other computation tasks. And your top level task declaration can still use the regular memory access interface. You might think that this is a lot of things to write. And uh, why, why we want such an interface? It's, it's complicated, right? Well, now let's imagine that you are given such a task, which is to read a thousand elements from, starting from address zero, and then do some computation, called four, and then write the result back to starting from address one. Can you do that? Well, in Tafa, because we decoupled the read requests from the read responses, this is very easy to implement. You just uh, issue read requests to the read address channel whenever you, you can do that and try to read data out. If you have su successfully read out the data element, you then write them to the output, the read channels. Simple, right? But it's not as simple if you don't have the asynchronous memory interface, right? If you try to just uh, write, write it back directly using YTSHRs, this is actually not doing the correct thing because you are supposed to read the old value out of the memory here, right? Also, this can give you a very long memory latency, just because the external memory has a long latency. Alternatively, if you want to get things right, you can do as follows, which is basically allocating a separate buffer to hold all the data elements, right? But that has a significant area overhead because you need the buffer to store the elements. It also requires a significant time overhead because you don't actually have to wait until your, for your computation to complete before you write data back, right? That's not good. With Tapa, this can be done as shown in this previous slide, all right? Another common limit, uh, commonly seen limitation brought by Vitis HRS is that it does not support shared external memory accesses if you are using data flow. This can become a significant problem if you are dealing with HPM based platforms where it has a limitation of um, 32 memory bundles exposed from the user logic whereas it also has 32 HPM memory channels. The result is that you essentially have to have a one-to-one -one mapping from each HPM channel to each user task instances. This means you will not be able to communicate between different tasks 
while sharing the HBM memory. Well, you can still use the memory passing, uh, the message passing interface, but that can complicate your design. Tapa provides a way to bypass this limitation and allow sharing external memory accesses between different task instances by creating a XE interconnect within the user kernel so that although the external world still sees maximum 32 interfaces, you can connect them to more than 32 task instances. Beyond more flexible memory accesses, Tapa also allows a more flexible task definition. We already mentioned that um, Tapa tasks are recursively defined, it's hierarchical. You don't have to squeeze all your designs into the uh, one single top level. You can instead define your task recursively so that you can reuse a lot of logic. Tapa also supports a very flexible coding style called detached tasks. It's uh, very similar to what the uh, detached threads is doing in standard C++. It essentially means that once a task is instantiated, the state machine or the accelerator will not wait for it until the program stops. And as a result, you can remove the, con the termination condition from your loops and the write infinite loops. This can be very helpful if your task is very small and the, the loop trip count or the loop iterator becomes a significant resource overhead. More on flexible accesses. Tapa provides a, a additional functionality for you to peek from the, stream, the input streams. It essentially, it allows you to decide which inputs that you can consume before you actually read from your input streams. This can be very helpful when you have to arbitrate among many different uh, input channels and you only want to read from one of them. Another convenient uh, interface provided by Tapa is called end of transaction or EOT for short. What it, it does is that it provides an universally available extra signal bit that can be used to signal the state of your input FIFO. This can be helpful when you are trying to avoid the overhead of your loop trip count, but you cannot detach your task for some other reasons. For example, if you need to do something after the uh, stream is being closed. Okay, last but not least, Tapa provides uh, parameterized uh, APIs. Imagine that you have finished the design of your PE and uh, now that you want to parallelize, but you don't know how many instances you should instantiate. Instead of uh, copy and pasting your designs and uh, manually explore the number of PEs that you should instantiate, you can write a, you can define a constant parameter. Here it's called a PE now. And uh, you can use the memory maps interface and streams interface to instantiate multiple instances or an array of instances of memory maps or streams. And when you are not, from, uh, you are not satisfied with your number of P's, you can simply change the number by changing your constant definition. Tapa will handle whatever is needed to change your design. As an example here, this uh, is uh, showing the same vector add example with some slightly different names. And um, the figure on the right hand side is showing the architectural view of the generated design. By varying the number of p num, you can parameterize your design and uh, change the number of instances for not only the computation task, but also the memory interfaces, right? Any questions so far? Okay, cool. Next, I will hand it back to Li Chen. He will talk about the future plans for our project. Uh, 
Uh, thanks for the presentation by Yuzhe. So uh, that concludes most of the features that Tapa currently have. And I will quickly just spend probably 10 more minutes to discuss uh, our future plans and what we are doing right now. So uh, I should, I've shown this figure before. So currently Tapa already addressed this challenge. We address this declining frequency, but still there's a problem that when you scale up the design, that your runtime is surging quickly. And we actually did a profiling of uh, Rivaldo when, uh, and we actually observed that on average, only two cores are active uh, during a backend process, even though it is running on a 56 core server. And we also, we also provide that as we increase the threads that Rivaldo is allowing to use, the, the yield quickly you know, decreases after like using more than five threads. So this is because you know, the, the backend algorithms, the placement routing algorithms, they're inherently sequential and it is hard to parallelize. And uh, so what we have done is that in our FPGA 2022 paper, we have uh, take this full planning idea one step further, right? So right now we already have the full planning or we, we split the device into different slots and we know that what, which task will be in which slots. So we already do this. So why don't we just place and route each slot in parallel and uh, compose them together? So that's uh, what we try to achieve in this project. So basically given the same data flow type of program and after we do other generation and we know that, okay, so each of these block, uh, boxes corresponds to one, uh, one slot of the physical device. And what we're trying to do is that we want to place and route this part, place and route this part, place and route this part, place and route all of them independently and uh, compose them back together in the end. So this significantly accelerate the backend process. And in our demonstration, you know, we test on some large scale data flow designs, we get, you know, so this, the blue bar, blue box is the runtime of rapid stream. The orange box is the, the runtime of uh, Rivado. Yes. Then we need to increase the slot size. So slot size is predetermined by let's say user. Yeah, so currently it's uh it's a predetermined, but uh we are planning to make it uh, uh heterogeneous and uh, basically uh, make it dependent on the input design. So if we have large design, large tasks, we may need to increase the size of the slot. And you can see that there's a huge time reduction from tens of hours to a few hours in the backend process and that can just completely change the game. But we are not there yet because, uh, okay, so so this is the, uh, again, we profile the CPU usage uh, with rapid stream. So compared to average two X, uh, I mean, average two cores active with rebuttal, we have on average 26 cores active. So we have a long tail here, but that's due to, uh, we have to invoke Rivado at the end for some reason. So that's a little bit too detailed, I'll skip here. Uh, so the problem is that we are uh, in our paper at the 2022, we just demonstrate this idea, demonstrate this potential uh, uh, runtime uh, compile time reduction. But what we are missing is that we still need to uh, make this work with whiteys. Uh, we need to add back those bodies APIs, those DMA DDRs, and uh, that's what we are missing and we'll be doing. So in this scenario, we will be uh, collaborating again with the Xilinx lab to finish this part. And uh, when that's done, that can be fully integrated into Taba and uh, Taba. So right now Taba is taking C++ generates RTO and we rely on Rivado. When this is done, Taba will take you all the way from C++ data flow to your B screen. And 
hopefully in just one or two dollars. So that's all, and uh, that's all the contents we prepared for today. And uh, uh, once again, we encourage you to take a look at our GitHub repo. And if you are still staying, I think that most likely something in Kappa that has interest to you. So we, again, we appreciate it. If you can give us a star, this helps us to get Kappa more exposed to the community and get us one, uh, help us in, increase the community. So right now, Kappa team has three developers, me, Yuzu, and Jason Law, who is not here. And uh, if more people are interested in this project and want to join this community, want to join the developer teams. Uh, we are more than welcome to talk to you. And if you have your customized needs, definitely talk to us. We can see if there's anything we can do to collaborate. As I mentioned, we just talked to you know, Professor Jim among from at uh, SFU, and we have a very successful collaboration and help them migrate from YTSHS to uh to to tapa and things work out well and uh we do have a lot of additional tutorial and examples on on our on our website so i can quickly uh show you so we have an overview some overview and some basic we have uh detailed installation instructions and how to update basically if you want to update Update Tapa is just do the installation process again. Uh, in today's tutorial, I have walked through this uh, getting started, basically how to, what, what this work that the program is about, how to compile it, how to simulate it, how to generate base stream. And uh, yeah, here, here we have more in depth uh, introduction of the flow planning. So flow planning is actually quite a complicated process. It's not just, if you only provide those two options in complicated cases, it may not work. So we have more uh, text about how it works, how to, how you can make it work better. And uh, yeah, basically. <laughs> and we have uh, some mini examples like React Ad that can help you get started. And they have the common features that Tapa has. And we'll, we also have a set of real world examples. So, so those examples are large scale, des large scale designs. They are published in FJ, FCCM, DAC. And uh, yeah, definitely take a look if you are interested. And uh, so here's a walkthrough of our document. And this is our repo. Uh, and I see seven more stars. And thank you for that. So basically, that concludes our tutorial today and in the end we have we appreciate the funding support of uh, a lot of programs a lot of funding sources here as, as i mentioned this Papa is not just one paper it's not just one project it, it spans like more than five years it's uh it's a uh, collaborated efforts from three generations of phds from the uh, UCL was lab directed by Professor Jason Kong. So Jason is not be able to make it here today he has to teach a lesson, uh, teach a class, but uh, he, he want me to say hi to everybody. And uh, yeah, that's all, thank you. Somewhat similar to what you're doing, it has a different focus. It's called Tapasco. And one thing that we have um, that might be of interest to you is we do have this on chip infrastructure for CPU hardware communications scaling from um, small scale embedded to zinc devices up to Verso uh -huh. um, and everything in between, a uh, couple of Alveo cards and other boards.
And in our projects, we use it quite a bit uh, to get pre-optimized uh, code uh, generated by, by another tool and integrate that with Vivado HLS module. Is something like that possible in your flow as well that I can use, uh, let's say, a very long RPL description? Yeah, 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 yeah. One of the VPEs and then integrate that with the rest of your infrastructure. Yeah, yeah, I think it's definitely possible. We, as I mentioned, we generate RTO to compose the task. So as long as we know what kind of menu RTO, so suppose we want to uh, combine it just code with menu RTO. So as long as the menu RTO, we know we have a, some agreed interface, then you know, we can compose them together. So there's no fundamental challenge. There. But we don't have that right now, but if there's a need, we will, we will have that. Okay, thank you. And for your question? Yeah. Oh, you, you said you have one question. No, I only had one question and the comment. So. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Then it is called Tapasco. C A P A S C O. It's also open source on GitHub. We also have similar names. We also have similar names. Ah, yeah. Sure. Yeah. Uh, we already decided to do that the work. As I said, it's, it's a bit different what we're doing, but I think there is sufficient overlap that we, we can profit from each other's infrastructure. For example, I am definitely going to try to get uh, your auto bridge integrated with Apasco because that is great work that you'll be doing. Thank you. <laughs> so, any other questions? Uh, I'm not sure if we have questions on Zoom. <laughs>